To track a glide slope and automatic landing control, we seek to align the velocity vector with the glide path. And we seek to control its magnitude on the glide path. These are two separate control objectives corresponding to separate control processes. Here, we focus on airspeed tracking. In this lesson, you will learn how to control aircraft airspeed with closed loop feedback. This includes the architecture, tuning trade-offs, and time domain response. We correct for a slow engine response with lead compensation, and as that compensator is in the feedback loop, we look at its effect on stability margins. We first obtain a linear model for control, starting with the nonlinear dynamics, trimming about a desired state, linearizing about the trim condition, and then obtaining the LTI system that describes the dynamics of perturbations about the trim condition. So we trim the model here about the glide slope for automatic landing control, and this is non-accelerating, non-rotating steady flight where the forces and moments about the center of gravity sum to zero. Applying the trim routine from section 1.7, we're trimming to a minus three degree fly path angle at 250 feet per second. And we trim with the elevator pitched up minus 16.2 degrees and 27% throttle. Linearizing gives this LTI model about that trim state. Now, in the previous lesson, we used these dynamics to develop a pitch control system. Here, we focus on airspeed control. And for this, our primary control input is to use the throttle channel. So this reduces the B matrix to a single column. And then for the rest of the system, we have to produce airspeed. So we select the C and D matrices to output airspeed from the state. Plotting the poles and zeros we observe three open loop zeros for this system, each of them near poles. First, notice the proximity of the short period poles to the zeros. They nearly cancel each other. Recalling that closed loop poles approach open loop zeros, we have a good idea of where this short period is headed. And if we wish to simplify the control design process, we could assume pole zero cancellation of the short period. The fugoid here is unconventional in the sense it does not exhibit oscillation between potential and kinetic energy. This would be associated with a complex pair, but note we have pure real poles. The pitch angle pole in particular is unstable, but the instability is slow, it being near the origin, with a time to double of about 42 and a half seconds. And we would expect this pitch pole as the closed loop system is tuned to approach its nearby open loop zero. And if so, this means thankfully, the right half plane open loop zero will ultimately limit the severity of that pitch instability. But we should not expect to stabilize pitch with airspeed control. Pitch control is the subject of the other control process in the automatic landing system. The architecture is comprised of a PI controller that changes the throttle, the throttle changes the engine thrust, and the engine thrust changes the airspeed. Our objective is airspeed tracking, or airspeed tracking the commanded airspeed with sufficient performance and also robustness. Let's examine each component. A proportional integral gain controller is defined by the gains it receives airspeed error input and produces a throttle command output. We model the throttle servo with a first order transfer function. A time constant tau t defines the response. It receives a throttle command input from the controller and outputs the achieved throttle position. We set the time constant to 0.1 seconds, representative of the response time. The engine response is also modeled with a first order transfer function. Time constant tau e defines the response. It receives the achieved throttle position and outputs thrust as a fraction that ranges from zero to one of total thrust possible. Here we select five seconds as the thrust time constant.
Finally, we have our aircraft dynamics. We've already determined this from the linearization process. So we will tune this controller with the full four state system having thrust input, airspeed output. And note that the variables with or without delta are used interchangeably. The deltas will be emitted going forward for brevity. To start, we first explore tuning without the throttle and engine. This is the open loop root locus with both proportional and integral gains set to zero. Also shown are the closed loop poles as white dots. For the zero gains, as expected, they overlay on the open loop poles. Now let's look closer near the fugoid. The integrator is a new pole from the controller. It has a value of zero since the integral air gain is zero. We also see the airspeed and the pitch pole. Now when tuning a controller, we often start with the innermost loop and work outward. So the innermost loop here, the proportional feedback loop, is going to be tuned. Watch what happens as the proportional gain increases. As expected, the pitch angle is approaching the right half plane zero. The airspeed moves into the left half plane, consistent with faster tracking, and the integrator pole is stationary since the integral air gain is zero. We set a proportional gain of 0.1, which puts the airspeed pole just left of minus one. The short period remains near the open loop zeros, and now we vary the integral air gain. Observe the effect. They approach each other on the real axis and then split near minus 0.5. Here's a hypothetical tune controller, which is by no means optimized, but something that we'll use going forward as we add more fidelity in the feedback loop. We explored things without the throttle and engine now we include them. Applying the same gains as before, we have the throttle at minus 10. Closer to the origin, we zoom in and we can see the short period, the engine pole, the pitch angle pole, and the integrator and airspeed as a complex pair. They're in the right half plane. So for these previously tuned gains, with the time delays of the engine and throttle, the system is unstable and it needs to be retuned. The slow engine response in the loop makes the system very sensitive to instability, particularly for non-zero integral air gain. We had to reduce the integral air gain by an order of magnitude, varying the proportional gain We see a trade-off of a slower engine pole with a faster integrator and airspeed pole. As the gain increases, the integrator and airspeed begin to move parallel to the imaginary axis, a diminishing return, meaning for more control effort, we just decrease damping. So we select a set of gains, again not optimized, but a compromise between rise time and the amount of integrator action. Note that non-zero integral air is important here because we seek to reduce steady state air in the closed loop step response. To the time domain, we see the step response is very slow. By inspection, a rise time of about five seconds. We have an undesirable amount of overshoot, poor tracking, and after 30 seconds, the slow pitch angle instability begins to build and dominates the response. And we've talked about this being addressed by a separate control system as part of the automatic landing system. So the main concern here is that very slow response and how to improve the tracking of the airspeed. To improve the closed loop step response, we introduce a lead compensator. It's the slow engine response that causes the problem with our tuning. 
we use the lead compensator to replace the slow engine pole at minus 0.2 with a pole at minus 4. The factor of 7.5 ensures the steady state gain of the compensator is 1. Now back to the pole zero plot with the lead compensator, we have the throttle at minus 10, the lead compensator pole near minus four, the short period, and near the origin cancellation of the engine pole with the lead compensator zero. Unstable pitch angle pole and the integrator and airspeed pair now stable. But with the lead compensator, in general, larger integral air gain is possible while avoiding instability. The same with the proportional loop. Closer to the origin. The lead compensator allows us to tune to larger gains for higher performance. And the result is significant. By inspection, a 1.5 second rise time versus a five second rise time, slightly less overshoot, greater damping, and steady state tracking of the airspeed with small bias error. But this is not the whole story. When using a lead compensator, we must be concerned with the amount of control effort, control saturation. There's no free lunch. To get this snappier step response, look at the dramatic spike in throttle momentarily near 100%. And this is only to track a one foot per second airspeed command. This won't do. So we back off the gain slightly and bring the lead compensator pull in to minus 1.5. We accept larger overshoot, larger rise time, but still greatly outperform the uncompensated system and adjusting the performance lower, naturally we use less throttle. This still may not be acceptable, but it's a step in the right direction to avoid engine saturation. We'll use the nonlinear simulation to guide future tuning. In contrast to the previous lesson, where we used a lead compensator outside of the pitch loop, In this lesson, we're including the lead compensator in the loop, which adds gain and adds phase, and thus it'll affect the stability margins. So we must check the basic stability metrics before accepting this lead compensator. First, consider the case without the lead compensator. Breaking the loop, at the plant input, we construct the loop gain transfer function. Then with the lead compensator in the loop, the compensator is part of the controller. So we break the loop at the plant input between the compensator and the throttle. That becomes the loop gain for the compensated system. Evaluating each loop gain, we get the Nyquist diagram without the lead compensator and that for the lead compensator. We tuned each loop differently with the biggest difference in the integral gain of the lead compensator. By inspection, we can see in the disc the margins will be different. The gain margin with the lead compensator is slightly less and the phase margin is significantly greater with the lead compensator added. Vector margin is also notably larger with lead compensation. So while both systems are robust, actually the lead compensated controller has improved robustness in two key metrics with a slight reduction in gain margin. We can see that in the unit disk, we have additional phase at high frequencies and reduced phase at low frequency. We can view what's happening with the phase angle geometrically. This is a pole zero plot of the loop gain without the lead compensator. Dots are poles, circles are zeros. At any frequency s, the phase angle of this transfer function is the difference between the angles of the zeros and the angles of the poles. To get this, draw lines from the zeros and poles to the value of s. 
add all angles for the zeros, then add angles for all poles, again, measured from the horizontal. The phase angle at that frequency is the difference between the sum of the zero angles and the sum of the pole angles. Here we only notate a few of the angles for illustrative purposes. This is the pole zero plot for the loop gain with the lead compensator overlaid on the original loop gain. The lead compensator loop gain having different pole and zero locations has different angles to S and therefore a different phase response. The difference is clear in the loop gain transfer functions. Note the different poles and zeros. This leads to different angles that create a different phase response. From this vantage, we can understand the effect of the lead compensator on the loop gain phase angle response. A geometric interpretation also exists for transfer function magnitude, but we won't cover that here. Let's explore the frequency domain a bit further. The Bode plot of the loop gain without the lead compensator here is shown. Now with the lead compensator, we see larger magnitude at all frequencies. This is consistent with the smaller gain margin of the lead compensated loop gain. And although it's lead compensated, as we saw before, we have phase lag at low frequencies and phase lead at high frequencies. The lead compensator shows phase lead peaks at about 0.1 hertz. Now focusing on this frequency, which is near the loop gain crossover frequency for the lead compensated loop gain, we observe an increase in loop gain from minus 11 decibels to zero decibels. The phase lead to the loop gain increases by 30 degrees. In the Nyquist diagram, we cannot see the precise dependence on frequency, apart from knowing that frequency increases as the loop gain curves approach to origin. 0.1 hertz corresponds to these points, where the lead compensated loop gain phase angle is approximately 30 degrees more than the original loop gain phase angle. As designed, the compensator adds phase to the loop gain where it is important, near the loop gain crossover frequency. For the original system, the crossover is at 0.046 hertz. For the compensated system, 0.092 hertz which leads to phase angles of approximately minus 131 and minus 140. And this is consistent with the additional phase margin of the lead compensated loop gain. Here we focused on airspeed control. We sought to understand the architecture, how to tune it, the use of lead compensation to correct for a slow engine response, and effective lead compensation on robustness. Our control architecture was a proportional integral system. We tuned root loci for various components in the loop and observed slow tracking ultimately due to a slow engine response. So we introduced that lead compensator and significantly improved tracking while allowing higher gains. We risked throttle saturation. So we backed off the gains a bit, but still had excellent performance and additional robustness in the sense of additional phase margin and vector margin. Overall, we found that actuation response is crucial to effective tuning, particularly when that actuator is slow. We found that including a lead compensator in the loop can improve tracking, but actuator saturation is a concern. And we saw that including a lead compensator in the loop affects loop gain and therefore stability margins. In the future lesson, we will apply the lead compensated airspeed controller developed here to the automatic landing control system. So far in the landing control architecture, we've covered the two flight control systems highlighted. In the coming sections, we will cover the geometry of the glide slope guidance law and simulate the automatic landing system in the nonlinear simulation. This is flight control fundamentals, section 1.6.3, Aircraft airspeed control with lead compensation.
A special thanks to all my Patreon subscribers. Without your support, this would not be possible. Access this lesson and more at learngnc.com.